gives me great pleasure to introduce you this morning to Lord Ron Oxburgh. He's the former chairman of Shell UK. He's uh, on the House of Lords Select Committee on Science and Technology. He's an honorary professor of Cambridge University, a fellow of the Royal Society, and was awarded the KBE in 1992. Can I ask you to please give him a warm welcome? Lord Ron Oxford. Please. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm amazed that there are so many people here after the splendid entertainment last evening. Um, a number of people have asked me what my title meant, uh, and the answer is I'll tell you at the end but it's deliberately um, ambiguous. Um, I thought that because this is ASPO, I ought to say something about peak oil. Uh, I've never actually pronounced or made any comment on peak oil because it has always seemed to me that the problem was at one level too easy and at the next level too difficult. Um, too easy in the sense that for anyone with a geological background, and a million years ago I was a geologist, it's obvious that the resources of the Earth's resources, fossil fuels, are finite. They simply aren't making oil anymore. And as we continue to use them up, it is pretty clear that there has to come a point at which we can no longer continue to produce them, at any rate in the quantities that we have in the past. Now, that is the most simplistic approach. But, of course, what you have to recognize is that in another sense, we are never going to run out of oil. All we are going to do is run out of cheap oil. Because, typically, when an oil field is abandoned, 60%, maybe even 70%, of the oil is left in the ground. Now, in most modern fields, with modern technology, that's less. But the reason it is left in the ground is that it is too expensive or appears to be too expensive to the people who are developing the field uh, to get out at the expected oil price during the life of the field. And so there is a lot of oil there, but it is simply going to be very, very expensive to get out. So it's not that we're going to run out of oil, but we're going to run out of oil that we can afford to use in the rather spendthrift and careless way um, that we have in the past. Um, the other general uh, idea that strikes me is that, in fact, in a sense, when and where the peak of oil production is, is in some senses an academic abstraction which will be of great interest to historians in the future. But from an economic point of view, what you're really concerned about is when demand continues to exceed supply. And that can happen even though supply is still rising. And so what this implies is that the predicted consequences, if you like, of peak oil can come much earlier if the demand curve continues to rise. Um, there are the other uh, and I said this was too difficult in some respects, there are the, there are the other complications of demand elasticity, um, uncertainty of future production, because to some extent, uh, how, much, um, how a field is developed today will depend on, uh, by the oil companies, will depend on their uh, view of the future of oil um, prices. And finally, uncertainty about oil substitutes, and as I shall point out later on, there are a number of these, <clears throat> and how fast they will come in. So I think the message, <clears throat> excuse me, is that, in fact, the economic consequences, quotes of peak, peak oil, may actually come upon us a little sooner than we were generally thinking about. But to move on, um, this is a slightly macabre cartoon um, from, from Le Monde. And you don't normally expect um, Le Monde and George Bush um, to agree, but up there you have the quote from George Bush, we have a serious problem, America is addicted to oil, and here you see the um, Le Monde uh, cartoon of this oil junkie there at the petrol pump injecting himself with gasoline. For those of you who can't quite read the 
caption, I'm hooked on it, I need my fix. And this is a pretty fair comment about the way that we are at present with oil. Now, why do we need oil as badly as we do? The fact is that the internal combustion engine, incidentally, I'm not playing with beads, I'm trying to get off my laser pointer. Um, the internal combustion engine really requires um, a fluid fuel, as was pointed out yesterday. And for a high efficiency engine, the engine mass and the mass of the fluid fuel have together to be, um, the mass has to be as low as possible. And this means that high energy density fluids are extremely valuable. And frankly, we are going to need them as long as we have the internal combustion engine. There is really no choice. And let's just look at energy density. This has been referred to by various speakers, but um, plotted vertically here, you have the amount of energy in megajoules per kilogram, and then you have a whole range of fuels that can be used. And in yellow, on the uh, left-hand side of the diagram, you have uh, essentially the traditional liquids. Incidentally there, um, in there, you have body fat, and you can see why uh, fat mountaineers who get stranded for a period without food tend to survive a little bit longer than those who are thinner. Um, but in the orange, you see the, uh, the various coals. Their energy density is significantly less than that. And way over here, you have cow dung, which is an important fuel, as many of you are aware. It doesn't say anything about the uh, equivalent, the male equivalent of cow dung. And if you think about that, you might think it was less useful. Um, um, then we have wood and we have household waste right at the end there. And I shall refer to that in a little while as well. Also shown, and not really registering on the vertical scale, is a lead-acid battery. In other words, you don't get a lot of energy per unit weight, but in fact, one of the benefits of that is that you actually can get it in a rather compact form. So I think <clears throat> what this diagram shows is the unique properties of these liquids on which we depend. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that we have, as you've heard now more times than you care to remember, increasing world energy demand, which is increasing because we have a rising world population and a rising per capita use of energy. And although I won't overemphasize the point today, in fact, the world energy shortage is at least as much attributable to the increase in population as it is to per capita use of energy. Another concern is security of supply. And partly this is because of progressively more restricted sources of oil and gas, and concerns about the political, quotes, management uh, of uh, uh, fossil fuel resources. And Mr. Putin's uh, actions, recent actions in Europe, have done nothing to relieve anxieties in this area. Then, of course, we have the problem of environmental security, greenhouse gases, and climate change. A great concern, and probably the largest and most important one, if we really stand back and take a proper view of this. But not one that I'm going to um, discuss in detail today, except in passing a number of times. And uh, finally, we have a world economy and infrastructure that is based on fossil fuels. And the problem is that it takes a long time to change our infrastructure. Um, most elements of our infrastructure uh, turn over at best on a 15 to 20 year time scale and some aspects 30 to 40 years. And so if we are going to change our infrastructure, and we have to, it has to be progressive and frankly if we're to meet the targets uh, the time targets for constraining carbon emissions, we have to begin now. So this is the problem, and we have all of these are balls which we are juggling with, and we actually have to manage all of these. So today, 
I believe is the end of the era of cheap energy, at least for another hundred years. It may be that uh, we have other energy sources that we don't dream of today, but I believe that for the t this is really the end of the uh, era of cheap energy. It is essential that we move away from fossil fuels as fast as possible, but it's going to be a slow process. And I think we are moving into a world in which there will be penalties for emitting CO2. And when we have oil at more than $70 a barrel, it's a new world. All sorts of things are possible. All sorts of things make sense. At more than $70 a barrel, that didn't make sense when uh, energy was cheaper. And I believe that the challenges are so great, the urgency is so great, that we actually have to do things now which may not, patently may not be the long-term solution. But the way I view it is the boat is sinking. There's a hole in the boat, and we've got to do everything we possibly can, desirable or undesirable, to stop the boat sinking and shove things into that, into that hole. So we may do some things that we don't much like, but we have no choice. Um, so what is going to replace fossil fuel? And I think we have to distinguish two quite distinct um, applications. We have to distinguish power generation, and there I think we have three major possibilities, coal, nuclear, and renewables, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later. And for transport, I think we have biofuels, and I think we have electrical propulsion. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as well. And if we look at world CO2 emissions, um, sorry, that should be gigatons, not megatons, at the top, um, in 2004, um, you can see that uh, we've got a great chunk associated with coal, and that is nearly all from power generation, from electricity generation, and a great chunk associated with oil, and that is nearly all from vehicles. So what are we going to do about oil in the long term? Well, I really have no idea, um, but I'm going to make some guesses for the intermediate term. And I think we have two parallel technical as distinct from social strategies. And the social strategies, of course, are um, changing our way of life to some extent, being more economical um, in our use uh, of fuel, not simply wasting fuel. But putting that aside, I think we have two technical strategies. The first is to find a substitute for find substitute liquid fuels for the ICE. The ICE is the internal combustion engine. And secondly, we have to progressively move away from the internal combustion engine for land travel. Parenthetically, I would note that at present, there doesn't seem to be much on the horizon um, to replace the internal combustion engine for flight. And that remains an open, difficult, and very interesting question. So what are the alternative routes to liquid fuels? Um, High energy density liquids, as I say, are needed as long as we use the internal combustion engine. And we can make liquid fuels from the other two main fossil fuels. We can make them from natural gas, and we can make them from coal. And by doing some clever chemistry with a Fischer-Tropf process, you can turn natural gas into a beautifully clean liquid fuel. Um, you can also do the same if you uh, gasify coal, and then you can make, using similar chemistry, you turn that into a liquid fuel as well. The pro and both of these, I have to say, are being done already. And uh, both processes are happening, but the problem is that they are very CO2 intensive. And frankly, if these are done um, on a large scale, on a global scale, it really would have disastrous environmental consequences in terms of the admission, emissions of CO2 to the atmosphere. If they are done, it is essential that those emissions be managed, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. So what is the alternative, or what is, is, is there a cleaner alternative? Well, I believe there is, and that is to use biomass. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But broadly speaking, biomass is anything that grew. 
and you can do three kinds of things with biomass. Any biomass, if you want, you can gasify, and the, you can produce a range of fuel liquids from gasified biomass. The difficulty is that the technology at the moment is certainly expensive and is, uh, there are aspects of immaturity to it. There are complications. Um, one of the oldest ways of making liquids from fuels, uh, from biomass, is to take uh, oily seeds and to crush them. And that way you generally can make a biodiesel, or you can take sugary um, uh, natural products, like sugars themselves, cornstarch, things of that kind. You can ferment them, and then you distill. Effectively, it's whiskey making, and you produce ethanol, which will mix with gasoline. Um, the trouble is that uh, current generations of biofuel have tended to be made from food products. Um, and that does not really make long-term sense in a world which is facing a population increase from about 6.5 billion now to around about 9 billion in 2050. And so biofuels can be a sustainable uh, alternative to fossil fuels, but they are not necessarily so. And although I wish, wouldn't wish to be dogmatic and say that it never makes sense to use, use foods to produce biofuels if you've got a local excess of, la of agricultural land or what have you, by all means use it, or you've got excess food, by all means use it, but it can't be a major long-term choice. So a sustainable biofuel has really got to have three important qualities. It, first of all, and this really seems obvious, it's got to have an energy content that is greater than the energy that was required to make it. It mustn't compete with food for either land or water, and it mustn't be at the expense of biodiversity. So if we look at the new generation, sometimes called second generation biofuels, um, probably one of the most interesting ways to go ahead is to look at agricultural residues. And here you see corn stubble left in the field. You can use corn straw or rice straw or forestry um, trimmings and things like that. And you can attack them with specially um, bred enzymes to break down the cellulose in their structures and that cellulose um, goes to sugars, and once you've got sugars, then you're into fermentation <clears throat> and distillation and production of ethanol. And indeed, this process is operating already. Shell and its collaborator, Iogen, in Canada, um, developed uh, an enzyme that would uh, uh, break down the cellulose in the enormous amounts of straw, which is a waste product, a byproduct of um, wheat production on the prairies, and they have a pilot plant operating on the perimeter fence of Ottawa Airport, um, which actually produces ethanol at, frankly, I have to say, some prodigious price, um, but is used to fuel U.S. government vehicles um, in Ottawa. So using agricultural residues, very important. And if you like, this is co-production of food and fuel. And the, um, uh, the next... Um, possibility is to use special plants. Now, you don't really want to use um, land which can be used to grow food um, for this. It must be something along the side. And so now there is considerable interest in uh, plants and trees that will grow on marginal land, land where conventional crops struggle. And elephant grass, such as you see here, is one of these. Um, uh, another one is the Jatropha tree, J-A-T-R-O-P-H-A. Jatropha, it's a variety of Jatropha, it's Jatropha quercus. And here you see plantations, the company I'm associated with at present, uh, of these um, little trees, uh, Jatropha trees, and actually they're intergrown here um, with okra in this particular situation. You can grow all sorts of things between these. These would, if left to themselves, grow into, me into trees <clears throat> four or five meters high. But in fact, these are young. But in any case, we tend to crop them down, to prune them down to about two meters. And they produce a fruit like that, um, which contains these black kernels. 
which you can then crush uh, to get a crude biodiesel. But again, if you look at the land there, you will see it's pretty, pretty uh, not very good land. And uh, certainly no one was able to grow anything on this. A bit of rough wild grass grew on it, but nothing uh, that was a really agricultural interest. Perhaps the biggest resource of all is urban garbage. Urban garbage contains an enormous amount of material um, that started off as being grown. Um, in other uh, organic material. Um, if you think of urban garbage today, it contains Sunday newspapers, grass cuttings, old shoes, waste food, you name it. There's an enormous amount of material there which contains CH bonds, carbon hydrogen bonds, and the energy can be released from those um, to produce energy. It's not my estimate, but it was done by someone who I respect, but the calculation was made that if you took the organic component of US urban garbage today, and you were to take all of the theoretically, the, take, take the theoretical maximum energy out of that, and that wouldn't actually be possible, but if you took it out, you would have enough energy to fuel the current US fleet of surface vehicles. Now, even if you, know, you can only get a quarter of, out, of that out, or 20% of it out, it is still a prodigious resource. And I guarantee that our grandchildren are going to look at us with astonishment when they read about what we're doing today. You thought you had an energy crisis, and you threw this stuff away, you put it into landfill, what were you thinking of? I think that's going to be the, respond, the response of our descendants. And just to emphasize the fact that if biofuels are going to be import part of the long-term answer, just look at the implications uh, for agricultural land if we grew them on agricultural land. You can see there the area of the continent and the area of the oceans. You see that we have about 42 million um, kilometers square of forests, deserts, um, crops. We have around about 16 million kilometers square, tropical savanna, and the rest. Now, look at that crop area and look what we would need to satisfy the current um, petrol requirement and the current diesel requirement. And it is clearly totally impossible. Um, you could not afford that land. So it is clear that if biofuels are going to be important, they either come from uh, crops which are grown somewhere over here, the edge of the desert or the tropical savanna, or they come from other wastes. So one of the, my second strategy, of course, was to move away, from road, move away from the internal combustion engine as fast as we could. So let's look at road vehicles briefly. And there you have at the top the iconic Chevrolet Impala of the 50s. I uh, had the opportunity to drive one of these when I was a graduate student in the US. Fantastic experience. But... Very inefficient. Only about 20% of the fuel that goes into the tank ends up being used to propel the vehicle, and they are heavy. And why are internal combustion engine vehicles so inefficient? Well, you waste energy idling, braking in the transmission, and you have this, every car today has this fantastic device uh, called a radiator, which is an element designed to actually to throw away energy. Now, there is a possibility of getting rid of most of those if we go to electrical drive. And the interesting question is where the electricity comes from. You obviously have a, you have a little electric motor on two or even four of the wheels. Does that electricity come from a battery or does it come from a fuel cell? Those are the two technologies that we have at the moment. So let's first look at the battery possibility. And of course, you, have, you all know about the Toyota um, Prius and the equivalent Honda, which I think were the two first major hybrid vehicles uh, on the market. So you have a battery, a substantial battery, and you have a small internal combustion engine which generates electricity, um, running relatively efficiently at constant speed when it's needed. Um, the next step forward is the plug-in hybrid, 
which is, uh, has got sufficiently uh, capable battery that you simply charge it up overnight and then you drive it during the day. And you don't really need an internal combustion engine. And some of you may have seen that some enterprising young people in California actually took a Toyota Prius and much to, I gather, to much to the annoyance of Toyota, actually modified it and put in a much better battery so that it became a genuine plug-in hybrid and you just charged it up overnight, uh, drove it during the day, and on you go. Um, the third stage is the all-electric vehicle. And, you know, we can see here that you, this depends on progressive battery improvement. And one possibility is that you exchange the battery every 400 kilometers. You don't actually fill up with petrol, you just change your battery. Or you might just change the electrolyte. Or there's another alternative which I shall show you in a moment. Now, you may say this is all pie in the sky, and everyone knows that electric vehicles are these dreadfully slow um, uh, milk floats that we see operating in Europe and where the drivers never seem to look over their shoulders and turn out in front of you uh, without your expecting it. But uh, think again. Here is the Tesla. This goes on market uh, in the US um, next year uh, at around about $100,000 US. Um, its uh, performance is not that of a milk float. It goes north to 60 miles an hour in four seconds and has a range of about 250 miles. Um, very impressive indeed. That, the idea is that you, 250 miles is probably as much as most people want to drive in a day. But, in fact, things have moved on a little bit, and there you see the UK offering uh, here. The difference is that there are, no, there are not yet any production models of this, the so-called lightning, but it has the same uh, acceleration properties um, as the, uh, as the uh, Tesla that I showed you a moment ago has a slightly lower range. But the really big and I think game-changing uh, difference here is that the recharge is 10 minutes. So if you can drive um, 200 miles and then take 10 minutes for a cup of coffee, you can go on driving this as far as you want. So I believe personally that this is the way forward for surface, um, surface transport in private vehicles. Now you may say, but where does the electricity come from? Well, obviously it comes from power stations um, where, which have to be fueled some way or other. But, as I shall show you later on, the power stations can either be powered by renewables, maybe by nuclear, um, but in any case, they can be um, power that is generated in power stations by fossil fuels. You can actually control the emissions. So, uh, what happens if we don't go that way, where we go the fuel cell way? And you have two choices with the fuel cell. Uh, either you can make your hydrogen in the car, uh, in fact, from normally from a fossil fuel, and frankly, that is, has very little advantage in terms of energy economics over the, the current generation of hybrids. Or you can have tanks of hydrogen, and that can be done but at the moment, it is difficult and it is expensive. It may still be the way forward, but it doesn't look the most promising way at the moment. What about weight? You can reduce weight if you use advanced materials. And two vehicles look like doing this at the moment. The Boeing um, 787, the new Dreamliner, which is going to appear, uh, I guess, next year, is very light indeed, and it's got remarkable fuel efficiency on that account. And there is a small German company is going to bring to market in 2009 the Lorimo, which has um, a small turbo diesel engine. Um, it's going to cost about 11,000 euros, but it's a very light car. You can see it's 450 kilograms. Um, but it has astonishing um, fuel capacity, around about 200 miles to the gallon. So there are ways forward for personal transportation. Now, the, to summarize on biofuels, the good news is that they can help the problem of waste management, they can create jobs in poor countries with marginal land, and they can, in principle, substitute for all fossil fuel liquids. The bad news is that produced 
uh, responsibly. They cost at present 90 to 100 dollars a gallon um, uh, equivalent, um, a barrel equivalent, and but they can be, be produced irresponsibly from foodstuffs more cheaply. Now let's move on to electricity generation. What's the clean menu? And it's a long menu, and I'm not going to talk about most of it. We clearly have modern nuclear. We clearly have the continuous renewables of hydroelectricity and geothermal. And we have the discontinuous renewables, as I call them, wind, waves, tides, solar. Enormous amounts of energy, um, but energy that is available when nature chooses, not necessarily when we want it. And of course, the brilliant thing about fossil fuels is that they store energy for use when we want them. These discontinuous renewables don't. And in fact, they, their application will be transformed if we get good means of energy storage. In other words, big batteries. And there is some hopeful news there. It's not certain, but I think it's going to happen. And that will transform the importance of those discontinuous renewables for energy generation. Um, we have the continued use of fossil fuels with trapped emissions. And indeed, that is what I'm going to talk about next. And then some way into the future, we may or may not have nuclear fusion. Now, it is just worth pointing out that even that from, uh, that there was in the early 20th century when uh, oil came onto the scene, there was actually quite serious competition between oil and coal. And of course, coal fueled the Industrial Revolution and, if you like, the first transport revolution because coal was what fueled the railroads. But in the 20th century, it was oil that fueled the road and air transport revolution. And both oil and uh, coal were cheap, and there was no incentive to efficiency. And intriguingly, that competition went on well into the 20th century. And I came across this rather bizarre um, Shell um, advertisement from 1929. And you can see coal there being defeated by oil as it comes forward. I think this is a remarkable historical um, curiosity. But that was published in 1920, 1929. And it's one of the more modern equivalents of uh, knocking, big early knocking copy. Anyway, why quite coal? Well, the point is there is a lot more coal um, than oil and gas. Uh, here you see from the BP Statistical Review the number of future years of use of oil, gas, and coal um, going forward. You don't have to attribute enormous significance to these. There are all sorts of things wrong with diagrams of this kind. But I think most people would agree with the general conclusion that coal over there on the right, there is an awful lot more of it left. And at least 100 years, even at the most outrageous rates of use. So why is that important? Why do we care about it? Well, you care about it, and you can see, that it's, see its role in future energy mixes if you look at this diagram here. Plotted vertically, uh, I think the PowerPoint has deprived me of the, sea, the units of the scale. I think that is um, billions of tons equivalent. But basically, you have uh, oil and gas um, shown there. And on the left, you have the main energy exporters, Middle East, Russia, Africa, South and Central America. And on the right, you have the three most energy-hungry economies of the world, the US, China, and India. And what is conspicuous is that they have very little gas and very little oil. But that changes profoundly if you add coal. And you can see that those three energy-hungry uh, economies together, in fact, have close to two-thirds of the world's coal. Now, that coal is going to be burnt. It's going to be burnt by each of those economies, probably for, for different reasons. I believe that the US is likely to burn that coal for reasons of energy security. And I believe China and India are going to use it because it's all they've got. Those are both poor countries. They're both rapidly uh, developing economies. They're both energy very hungry indeed. Now, the fact is that if that coal is burnt and the CO2 simply goes off into the atmosphere, 
um, without uh, any constraint at all and is not trapped, it is going to swamp anything that we do in the developed world <coughs> to manage our emissions. Um, and just to make the point, if you, uh, although your emissions depend both on the fuel and on the combustion mode, the orange shows you coal burnt three different ways. Conventional hard coal on the left, <coughs> coal in an integrated uh, combined cycle gas, tur gas turbine in the middle, a little bit more efficient. But if you can, um, if you modify a coal-fired power station to trap a, the greenhouse gases, separate them from its emissions, and do something with them, you can come down here, you can come down to that sort of level. Now, that is that or better is what has to be achieved if we are not com going to completely destroy the environment with our CO2 emissions. And the solution shown here in this cartoon is, of course, carbon capture and storage. The idea is that you have a coal mine over here on the left, um, that you have a power station ideally close to it, um, generating electricity going off down the power stations. You capture the CO2 and you transport it by pipeline and then push it back, probably underground, probably initially into abandoned oil or gas field. Um, then um, you have these three stages. They're pretty well known. Um, carbon capture is feasible with current technology. The problem is that it increases capital cost, uh, roughly by 30%. And it reduces your efficiency because you've got to take, use the energy to take the CO, CO2 out of the exhaust gases and then do things with it. Um, the technology is still immature, but it's developing. Um, transport of the gas is pretty well understood. There have been, uh, you had a talk yesterday from uh, Gareth Roberts briefly. His company, a number of others in the US, have been managing CO2. Uh, transporting it long distances by pipeline and then putting it underground for a number of years. Um, so the capture re represents the real technology, the largest technological challenge. It isn't that the other two are necessarily easy, but the capture is where the effort has to go in. The trouble is that at present there is very little commercial incentive for anyone to do this, and governments are going to have rapidly to introduce regulatory or fiscal incentives if major companies who are involved here are to take this seriously. Now, I mentioned a moment ago the very serious consequences. If um, the third of uh, those developing countries, and indeed for that matter the US, anyone who is burning coal, um, pushed their uh, emissions out of the atmosphere. I'm going to take China now as an example. Um, you could do the same for India, you could do the same for other countries. But here, on this slightly peculiar plot, vertically you've got tons of oil equivalent per capita per year. In other words, individual energy use plotted vertically on the, on the left. Plotted horizontally, you've got population in billions. And you can see that in 1965, China had a population of a little over 700,000. And each of the spots as we go forward represents uh, the successive year. You can see by 2000, China had um, continued to grow, but in subsequent years the population was stabilizing, but per capita energy use was increasing rapidly. In other words, it's turned this corner. Now, the reason for taking this slightly odd diagram is that it allows you to do several things. First of all, there is China today. Let's look where the developed countries are today. You see the developed countries' per capita use is very much more extravagant than that of China. We are way up there. Now, given that the horizontal axis is numbers of people and the vertical axis is amounts of energy per head. If you multiply those two together, you obviously get energy use, total energy use uh, by that country, which is a sort of proxy for emissions. So if we do that, that represents the emissions of the developed world today. Now, if we take China, we can do exactly the same thing for China, and that is China's current emissions.
And you can see that if you transpose this little bit to the right, uh, up here, you can see what have now has been commonly said. You can see that uh, China's emissions today are roughly half those of the developed countries and indeed roughly equivalent to those of the United States, which is responsible for just under half the emissions of the developed countries. So far, so good. If we fast forward to 2015, and there is little... Um, chance that that is not a perfectly reasonable extrapolation. China is still building coal-fired power stations very fast indeed and will continue to do so because per capita energy use, uh, per, per capita energy availability is so low. You can see that by that time China's emissions will probably be at least the same as those of the developed countries. Now my purpose in showing this is not really to say anything about China but simply to make a comment on the developing world and the developed world. If we do not develop the technologies to cheaply capture the CO2 from burning fossil fuels, almost anything else we do will be totally swamped. And that is why I believe that carbon capture and storage is the most urgent technology that we have to develop. So my conclusions. We are, this is the end of cheap energy. We're in a different world. The demand is enormous, and we're going to need everything. I, I don't have much patience with people say, I'm for nuclear, or people say, I'm for renewables. Frankly, we're going to need everything we can possibly get. There isn't a single solution. There isn't a silver bullet. For power, we're going to have to use renewables, nuclear, coal with carbon capture and storage, and, of course, gas. Um, carbon capture and storage is essential and inevitable. And for transport, I think it's biofuels and electricity. For air transport, yeah, probably we're going to have to use biofuels. But we have to recognize that nothing can happen overnight. And decades are needed for infrastructural change. And that change will be profound. And so we have to start now. Now, I promised to explain my title. What is the hot water? Well, the first hot water is, of course, the real difficulties that we're in. We talk of getting into hot water, and we seriously do have problems. It's not inescapable, but the problems are there. The second is that we have warming oceans. Climate change is warming the oceans, and that is, again, hot water. It's bringing on climate change, and it's making more frequent extreme climatic events. The third is, well, some of you know me, know that I worked for 15 years in geothermal energy. I'm simply using geothermal energy as a metaphor for the renewables of which we have to make much more use. And the final point is the parable of the frog, which some of you may know. The frog had been warmed by his mother frequently not to jump into the pan of hot water on the stove, even though it was a very comfortable place to sit and relax. But the frog, the frog didn't take any notice of his mother. He thought it was a lovely, nice, warm um, sauna. He hadn't noticed that the flames were turned up beneath. And he jumped into the pot. And as one of my Irish forebears might have said, when he woke up, he was dead. <laughs> um, in other words, he moved into that situation where he was very comfortable, went to sleep, complacently to sleep, and ultimately disaster struck. The question is, is this us? Thank you very much.